is always negative, so it gets old. Butts and heifers? Good job with review, you ignorant pig. <sniffs> Fuck you, man. Stop to talk trash, asshole. How can a man have so much negativity for a product for so long? Give up! Watching. You're only washing your time. You're really bad at YouTube. Quit! This review sucked! Well, probably. All you do is bitch! Hmm. Fuck you, you suck, you little pussy, you look like a bitch! Oh, that's not nice. Complain! That will change things! Uh, touche. Don't worry, you'll see Schleich Daddy's twitching eye ass tomorrow. That they will. Go fuck yourself and I'd love to shoot you in the head, you bitch! Oh, that's mean. Luigi PS, 540,000 subscribers. What culture? 1.2 million subscribers. Pathetic, sexist, bitter, crybaby hater. 15,000. Sounds about right. You know what? Maybe they're onto something. Maybe, just maybe, they're onto something. You know what? We got to shake things up a little bit. We're gonna try something different. I don't know what to say. I don't know what more to do. Time for a 100% positive raw review. You know what? Maybe they're onto something. Maybe they're right. Your attitude, after all, does create your altitude. Maybe it's time for me to expand my horizons, change my perspective, improve my outlook. As the ladies would say, maybe, fake it until you make it. So we're going to do this. No negativity in this review. It's going to be 100% positive. Everything I talk about on this show is going to get some type of praise of some sort. Join in with me in the comments section. It'll be fun. Let's see how this goes. No frills, no characters, no anything. Just nuts and bolts down to business. Good old fashioned positive WWE Raw review. Let's get started. The opening segment. With Stephanie McMahon and Asuka, it makes perfect sense to have this segment be what opens up Raw, especially considering the Women's Royal Rumble main evented the Royal Rumble. You have the face of the WWE in terms of women truly in Stephanie McMahon, and you have Asuka, the winner of the Women's Royal Rumble. So you were giving her a platform, you were giving her shine, you touched on the history that was made with the Royal Rumble main event, you announced the Women's Elimination Chamber match, history being made once again, Sasha Banks comes out and says she's ready for Asuka, she was the Iron Woman of that going over 50 minutes, so you're tying this opening segment to a match between Sasha and Asuka later on in the show, and the segment was less than 10 minutes. You got so much done in such a short period of time, it was refreshing. It really got the show off to a fast, brisk type of tempo that we know Raw really needs. And you get the announcement of the Elimination Chamber qualifying matches. What a great concept. It's a way to, you know you have three hours of TV to fill, why not sit there and take that time and use it to tie directly into the pay-per-view? It's a great concept. Take these Elimination Chamber qualifying matches, make your shows mean more the next couple of weeks, and already really begin that interest, that build-up towards the pay-per-view. Seems perfectly logical to me. And you start off right away with Braun Strowman versus Kane. No long drawn out affair is short, sweet, and to the point, and not a standard raw match where you're just exchanging moves and so forth. It was high impact, it was a street fight, it was the type of grudge match you would expect out of these two guys. Uh, tipping over the commentary table like Braun Strowman did was something he hadn't really done before, so it still works, it's still fresh. And technically, as Braun pointed out, he did live up to the type of match that it was, last man standing, and at least the WWE acknowledged that Kane was really messed up here and sent him for a ride in the ambulance. So they did everything that they should have here. Elias versus Matt Hardy. How crazy is this? How cool is this? So many of us want to walk with Elias, and now Elias beats Matt Hardy, and he's going to be in the Elimination Chamber match which means he's probably going to get some type of semi-important feud for WrestleMania. That's not bad for a guy that came in from NXT and you really didn't know what they were going to do with the Drifter. 
What you know is, is that he's one of the most interesting and over characters they have on the Raw roster right now. And even with Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt, they laughed. So they had a good time. We can have a good time too. It wasn't an Elimination Chamber qualifying match, but Roman Reigns versus The Miz for the IC title. The Miz and Roman have pretty decent chemistry, and it's a good way to try and appear to bring down Roman just a little bit, while at the same point in time really building Miz up relatively nicely. This is two wins in a row by The Miz over Roman Reigns. And you did it in a way where he got the type of heel help he should have, but it wasn't so overpowering and so overwhelming that it makes him look bad. It made him look pretty good. I mean, it really elevates the profile of The Miz. And you could see where they're positioning for some type of important program for him come WrestleMania revolving around the IC title. And of course, I'm down with that. And furthermore, when you think big picture into 2018, especially if they're going with Roman Reigns, winning that chamber number one contenders match, beating Lesnar for the universal title. Now you have a real reason to put Miz back in the world title scene at some point in time in 2018. You can go right back to this feud again. I love when you can do booking for now and do booking for later. And this is an example of that. The Revival beat Rhino and Heath Slater. And all I've got to say, Grand Brothers reference, FTW. Sure, awesome. Sasha Banks versus Asuka was the two-hour main event. It was stiff. It was high impact. And even when you talk about like Sasha diving out through the ropes and almost breaking her neck, landing on her head, you could at least glean from that that this match means a lot to both competitors, that Sasha was truly ready for Asuka, that Asuka was a big deal, and that Sasha is also a big deal, and you're not just having Asuka blow right through the person that lasted over 50 minutes in the Women's Royal Rumble the night before. And when you do see spots like that, you can at least point to it and say, it feels like this is important, it feels like this is serious, this lady is going to do whatever it takes to win. And you can understand that. So much about wrestling is about being able to relate to what's going on and what you see. And that's something that you can relate to. And that's something that you can get into. Then you've got Titus Worldwide versus The Bar. It was a raw tag team title match. A surprise tag team title match. Hey, just thrown in. That's cool. Titus Worldwide got a tag title shot. Cool. That's what I'll say about that. Titus O'Neil on my TV makes me feel good sometimes. Gives me warms and fuzzies. I'm like, every once in a while, he does a good job of entertaining me. And I feel like he took this gimmick that wasn't intended to do a whole lot and really made something out of it. So I appreciate that. I have no problem with them getting the shot. I also don't mind the fact that you had the bar defend the tag team titles here, but then they still keep it, so that way you figure out what you're going to do with them next down the road. We got the announcement that had been revealed earlier on in the day of who was going to be the next inductee, or in this case inductees, into the 2018 WWE Hall of Fame class, and it was the Dudley Boys. The Dudley Boys, who we just saw on the Raw 25th anniversary show. They were probably one of the highlights of that night. And when you think about the Dudleys, they did it all. ECW, Japan, obviously WWF slash WWE, one of the most important, significant, and one of the truly greatest tag teams of all time. And a tag team over the years that was able to adapt and adjust, you know, they also did really good things in TNA as well. Let's not leave that out as we're so often prone to do. I mean, when you're talking about a tag team, you think about the Road Warriors to me, and you think about the Dudley Boys in terms of being successful everywhere they went, making money everywhere they went, and being stars everywhere they went. Obviously, clearly deserve their spot in the Hall of Fame. But then we get to the main event. The last of the three Elimination Chamber qualifying matches. It's Finn Balor. It's John Cena. It's Balor Club versus Breakfast Club. Who's going to prevail? This was interesting. Because there was a big part of me that thought that Finn Balor might win this. They seem to have gotten a little bit behind Finn Balor and the Balor Club. They seem to want to be doing it, even if it's just for reasons to maybe troll uh, the Young Bucks or whatever, and we should always be down with that. Uh, but there was a part of me that made me wonder, were they going to have Finn Balor win this? Were they going to put him in the Elimination Chamber match? Ultimately, that's not the case, because while you might like the Balor Club, the Breakfast Club can still rule bitches when they choose to, and John Cena did here. 
But ultimately, when you think about the Elimination Chamber, it makes more sense to have a John Cena in there than it does a Finn Balor. And I'm sure there was a lot of rage and a lot of anger because Finn Balor did not win this match. But it's okay. It's not the end of the world. More likely than not, you would assume what you're going to get some type of tag title feud between them and the bar maybe for WrestleMania. I don't know. I mean, but even putting Finn Balor in that Elimination Chamber match is no guarantee that he's going to have a featured feud for WrestleMania. And as far as John Cena, you have to, when you've got him in the fold, get the most out of him you possibly can. Because let's face it, from a business standpoint, John Cena is still more valuable to WWE's overall bottom line. He's more valuable than a Finn Balor is. And that's not a knock on Finn. That's just about a decade plus of Cena being the top guy. Uh, the number of kids that love him and buy his merch and so on and so forth. So there are business reasons for that. So I don't have a problem with John Cena winning this. I really wouldn't have had a problem with Finn Balor won it. It, it just kind of was what it was, you know. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Aw, shucks, as long as the match was good, and I thought this was, that's all that really matters, right? So when I look at this show coming off of the Royal Rumble, that honestly I did not enjoy very much, but that's okay. I enjoyed Raw quite a bit. I really, really did. I love how there were three matches that tied directly into the pay-per-view of Elimination Chamber. Elimination Chamber qualifying matches were a great idea. The opening segment, which sometimes can be a big slog, absolutely was not here. It was short, sweet, to the point, and touched on the things that it should have and still set up a match for later on for the night. That was hard-hitting. That was rough. That was brutal. That was everything you've come to love out of the Divas Revolution. So I enjoyed this show quite a bit. I really, really did. I hope you enjoyed this 100% raw review, 100% positive raw review from OTRS Central. Not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Because as easy as it is to be negative sometimes, sometimes our attitude creates our altitude. We've got to improve our outlook, change our perspective, and just by golly, be more positive. That's it. Raw was great. Raw was stupendous. Please feel free to share your thoughts on this week's Raw in the comments section below. And if you wouldn't mind, if you enjoyed this 100% positive Raw review, why don't you go ahead and click that subscribe button too.